For the next two hours, you're invited to listen to Christmas on the Blues. On Christmas Day, 1944, the now independently owned Blue Network, who'd soon officially change their name to the American Broadcasting Company, broadcast a two-hour spectacular called Christmas on the Blue. New York, San Francisco, Paris, Pearl Harbor, and the European battlefront. To make your Christmas a merrier one, you'll hear... Paul Whiteman and his orchestra. Wendell Niles and Don Prindle, Lawrence Tibbet and Reese Steele. It was a special filled with B-level stars to help promote the new network's plans for 1945. It was also a cheerful and slightly subdued celebration. But for the first time, Americans could feel the end of the war victoriously approaching. Before we switch you to New York to hear American families talk with their fighting men overseas, I'd like to remind you of just one thing. Those valiant men and women are spending their Christmas in muddy shell holes, jungles, and on desert islands so that we can spend Christmas in our warm, comfortable homes. Help bring them back next Christmas by buying more bonds than you have ever bought before. Please don't forget them this Christmas. And now, Christmas on the Blue takes you 3,000 miles... Before the war ended, on April 12, 1945, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, then at the outset of an unprecedented fourth term, passed away at Warm Springs, Georgia. He was 63. FDR had guided the U.S. through the greatest economic depression in the country's history and the greatest world war in modern times. He left behind a lasting legacy that still endures, and he'd used radio as his chief medium to communicate with the citizens that had re-elected him over and over. First of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. On April 30th, 1945, Adolf Hitler committed suicide during the Battle of Berlin. Germany's surrender was authorized by his successor, Karl Donitz. The final document signed on the 8th of May in Berlin, Germany. About 2.30 in the morning, General Tui Spatz walks in. He is followed in quick succession by the Russians. Then Air Marshal Robb comes in. Admiral Burrow. Pretty soon, Beetle Smith himself enters. The man who bore the brunt of the long hours of negotiation. Then the Germans come in. Yodel's face is like a death mask. Drawn, unnatural looking, and with every muscle in it clenched. They reach the table, bow in unison, and wait. I don't know whether it began with a lust for prestige, it began with a conscionable attitude toward broadcasting. They felt we ought to have a program when the Nazis surrendered. That was VE Day. So they asked me to suspend a series that I was then working on, it was the, the second edition of Columbia Presents Corwin. And they said, no, would you stop, knock off, and immediately begin work on a program to be ready on the night of victory in Europe because we have information from Washington, from the White House, that they expect us to be imminent. So I did. There was no time to be lost, and I prepared on a note of triumph. On May 13, 1945, with war in the Pacific still going on, Norman Corwin's On a Note of Triumph was broadcast. 60 million tuned in. Lauded by Carl Sandberg as one of the all-time great American poems. Martin Gable narrated. Bernard Herman conducted. Is victory a sweet dish, or isn't it? And how do you think those lights look in Europe after five years of blackout going on to six? Brother, pretty good. Pretty good, sister. The kids of Poland soon will know what an orange tastes like. And the smell of honest-to-God bread, freshly made and sawdust-free, will create a stir in the streets of Athens. There's a hot time in the old town of Dnieper-Petrovsk tonight, and it is reasonable to assume the same goes for a thousand other cities, including some Scandinavian. It can at last be said without jinxing the campaign, somehow the decadent democracies, the bungling Bolsheviks, the saps and softies were tougher in the end than the brown-shirt bully boys, and smarter too. For without whipping a priest, burning a book, or slugging a Jew, 
without corralling a girl in a brothel or bleeding a child for plasma. Far-flung, ordinary men, unspectacular but free, rousing out of their habits in their homes, got up early one morning, flexed their muscles, learned as amateurs the manual of arms, and set out across perilous plains and oceans to whop the bejeepers out of the professionals. This they did. The kind of uh, impression it made both in the listening audience of the general public and within the radio industry was extraordinary in that the president of Mutual Broadcasting and Competing Network uh, sent a telegram to Paley saying, when uh, radio distinguishes itself in this fashion, it is good for the entire industry and we want to congratulate you and thank you. And, you know, that kind of thing. CBS itself, the program originated here in California, but at New York at 45 Madison Avenue, the headquarters of the network, a memorandum went around that day the following day, saying, those of you who missed that broadcast last night, for those of you, we are declaring an hour, suspending work for an hour between three and four this afternoon, and all of the audition rooms will be available to have that program piped into these rooms so that those who missed can hear it, and those who heard it can hear it again. Uh, you know, it was given that kind of treatment. It is a little hard in the light of, uh, to, of the technological and, and productional advances that have been made since that time, which after all, 30 years ago, anyway, to estimate the degree of novelty and excitement that that generated. It was quite new, and the devices which I used and the kind of uh, rhapsodic sweep of the concept were entirely fresh. The first eyewitness account of the explosion of the first atomic bomb on Japan has just come in from the Pacific. It is given by the men who carried this revolutionary new instrument over Japan and unleashed its fury squarely on the militarized city of Hiroshima. Back safely at their base, they report the blast, first of its kind in all the long history of warfare, was tremendous and awe-inspiring, and that the destruction must have been extensive. From their modest words, it's clear that this historic mission was a complete success. Three months later, at the behest of new President Harry Truman, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6th and 9th. 7 p.m. Eastern Wartime. Bob Trump. Japan surrendered. The within Japanese the week. have accepted our terms fully. That's the word we've just received from the White House in Washington. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the Second World War. The United Nations on land, on the sea, in the air, and to the four corners of the earth are you... They called me up, uh, gave me about six hours notice. They called me and said, would you go on the air with something on VJ? I did a 15-minute thing. In those days, one was very rich in, in the talent resources, and I had no less than Orson Welles and Olivia de Havilland do that for me. Oh, that was called 14 August, which is published. It appears in the last of the three collections called Untitled. And I've done. Congratulations for being alive and listening on this night. Millions didn't make it. They died before their time. And they are gone, and gone. For the fascists got them. They are not here, but their acts are here. <laughs>